The Paradoxical Commandments that you first published in 1968 have gone all over the world and have been used by millions of people. Amazing. Can you give us some background on them? Like what was happening at the time you wrote them and how did that cause you to write them? Oh, okay. Um, I guess for the backstory, we have to go pretty far back because it really starts with my involvement in student government. Uh, and that really started early. I think I was in fifth grade when I first served on a student council. And then uh, when we were at Stevenson Intermediate School, ninth grade, I was a freshman class treasurer. And then junior year, I was student body vice president and then student body president at Roosevelt High School. Um, and then I was president of the Honolulu High School Association, which was all the presidents. And then I led a team that started the Hawaii Student Leadership Institute to train incoming student council um, officers and leaders. And um, I got involved uh, to the extent that when I went on to college, I continued and um, I was flying around the country making presentations and writing booklets. I was sort of a part-time consultant on student councils. Um, I gave more than a hundred of those presentations in eight different states. And uh, uh, so it was, a, it was really a, a big thing for me. I was in college from 1966 to 1970. So I guess, why was I flying around the country giving speeches? Well. It was the 60s, and you know um, that was a provocative time. You know, a lot of uh, conflict and confrontation, but also you know idealism and hope. So, the Berkeley um, uprising, free speech movement, was like 1964. So that had already happened. Um, later, Columbia was in 1968. Harvard was in 1969. Uh, the Kent State shootings, uh, really sad, in 1970. So a lot of this turmoil, and I think a lot of the small groups were doing things that were, well, to me, pretty, pretty violent. I mean, you know, they were seizing buildings, they were throwing rocks at police, they were starting fires, they were smashing windows. Um, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of reactions to that. Um, I thought we ought to be able to figure out how to work together to, to bring about change. But, you know, when, when your campus moves left, uh, you begin to look more conservative. And I've, I always felt like a moderate, but I remember at Harvard in the spring of 69, when the campus was pretty much shut down for a, for a month, um, one of the so-called revolutionaries came to me and said, Kent, when the revolution comes, you're going to be the first to go. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know where. I mean, he didn't tell me where I was going to go, but apparently it wouldn't be a nice place. Um, so, I mean, it was, a, it was a provocative time, and the issue seemed to me to be, okay, change. I wanted to bring about change. Uh, but in my speaking and writing, I talked about, hey, can we figure out uh, some common goals, common values, can we work together, can we work through the system to bring about change? I was traveling and I was speaking, but I was also listening and watching, and it began to, to be clear to me that we taught a lot of young people the American ideals, but we didn't teach them how to implement them. So they didn't really know how to bring about change, other than these big symbolic acts like seizing a building or something. Um, so that was something that really troubled me, and I decided I would write something. Um, it took me a while to decide, but eventually um, it was really uh, something practical about how to bring about change by working together. And that thing that I wrote was called The Silent Revolution, Dynamic Leadership in the Student Council. So that was meant to be a practical sort of how-to book. But the other thing that really concerned me when I was watching was I saw so many sort of young people with, with these ideals and, and, and a desire to bring about change. I saw them go out into the world um, to make a difference, and then they came back, but they came back much too soon. And they were sort of embittered, discouraged, disappointed, because the change they wanted to bring about wasn't happening. And people didn't seem to appreciate what they were trying to do. So I tried to address that directly in my, in my speeches when I was traveling, and I tell them, well, first of all, you gotta love people. I mean, you've gotta love people, you've gotta care. Love is one of the only motivations that's strong enough to keep you with the people and with the process until the change occurs, because change usually takes time. I actually said, if you don't love people and you're in a leadership position, you should resign, because you're going to do more harm than good. Just get out. Don't even try. The other thing I told them is, hey, wait a minute. If you go out and do what you think is right and good and true, then you're going to get a lot of meaning and satisfaction. And you know, you've got that no matter what. If people appreciate you, that's fine. But if they don't, you still have that meaning. And the message I tried to, to share was, if you have the meaning, you don't have to have the glory. 
And that was a message that I'd gotten myself only a couple years earlier, and I remember exactly when it happened. Um, it was at Roosevelt High School. It was the annual awards assembly when awards were going to be given to students. And it was held in the stadium, which was the only place big enough for the whole student body to, to gather. And I remember I was walking toward the stadium, and um, well, this is kind of embarrassing. I was, I was a, a, a pretty cocky kid. I know, it's hard to believe, but I was a pretty cocky kid. So as I was walking toward the stadium, I was not wondering whether or not I would get an award. I was just wondering how many awards I would get. So, yeah, it was pretty bad. But as I walked into the stadium, it suddenly occurred to me that I felt so good about what I'd done, about what I'd learned, about the things we'd accomplished together. I felt so good about that that I didn't need any awards. I just didn't need them. I had already been rewarded with the meaning and satisfaction that came from doing all those things. And that was a moment of, of tremendous uh, liberation for me. That was a moment of immense peace. That was like lifting this huge weight off of my shoulders. I, I came to the understanding that if I had the meaning, I didn't have to have the glory. That would be enough. And so that was part of what I was trying to put into this book, a practical book about how to work together to get things done, but really concerned about the meaning and motivation. So the paradoxical commandments were actually in a chapter about brotherly love. And they were there to try to encourage student leaders to focus on doing what was meaningful because that would sustain them. That would be enough. That could keep them going no matter what.